bad advisors. So, what kind of advisor should you be working with? One that is truly an independent agent. One that has your best interest at heart, and one that can place product with any company that they're able to uh, get contractually set up with. Now, that also means that an independent agent can't sell what? A captive company's product. So an independent agent isn't going out and selling New York Life or State Farm. So is that a downside? Not necessarily, but it's something you have to be aware of. So when you talk to your agent, you ask him those questions, what are you going to ask them? One, are you an employee of an insurance company? If you are, just turn around and walk out. There's no chance that you're going to get independent advice. Two, are you, are you contractually limited in some manner with the advice that you can give? Again, they don't necessarily have to be an employee to be contractually limited. Three, are you, uh, if you're independent, do you work within an IMO that is owned by an insurance company? That doesn't necessarily mean right off the bat that they can't give you good advice. It means that the chances that they'll give you advice go down dramatically. And again, how long has your marketer been in the industry? You want to know that as well. Believe me, when you ask these questions of your insurance advisor, they will be floored. Like, how do you know even to ask these questions? And you can smile and say, well, I read this book called Bad Advisors, How to Identify Them, How to Avoid Them. And while not every advisor in the insurance industry knows me, many of them do, though. They'll, they'll either get a smirk on their face or they'll have a, a, a look of disdain. So be careful. But, um, but in any event, you should be armed with the knowledge uh, just from this presentation to be able to ask your insurance advisors the appropriate questions so you know whether they're good or bad advisors. All right, let's move on to another subject matter, another type of advisor. We're going to talk about securities licensed advisors. But before I do that, I'm going to get into what are called uh, the, well, the concept of broker-dealers. You may not know the term broker-dealer, and I will simply use BD in my presentation for, for brevity. So what is a BD? It's a company in the business of buying and selling securities, which doesn't mean a whole lot yet to you. But have you heard of Merrill Lynch, and A.G. Edwards, and Raymond James, and AXA, and Northwestern Mutual, and New York Life? Have you heard of these companies? They all are broker-dealers, or they have broker-dealers. And so why do they exist? Well, they exist because securities licensed advisors, you know, Joe, Joe Schmo on the corner who's selling stocks and mutual funds, most of them, the way that they're currently licensed, have to sell those securities, stocks, mutual funds, bonds, have to sell those securities through a broker dealer. So if you want to think of a broker dealer sort of as a clearinghouse that has all of these different advisors underneath them, that's really what it is. So the advisors will go out and sell a stock or mutual fund, but they're not doing it directly. They're having to do it through a broker dealer. Um, all right, so why do they exist? Well, for the most part, they exist for oversight. They're supposed to train agents, advisors, whatever you would like to call them, and they're supposed to give them oversight, okay? It's a little bit of an oxymoron when you do the research on the industry, but that's the way that it is. So how do BDs make money? Well, they make money from commissions and fees. Uh, and how do the agents make money? Commissions and fees. We have upfront commissions, back-end commissions, 12B1s, redemption fees, accounting fees, purchase fees, management fees, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of fees out there. If you actually knew the fees that you paid in your mutual funds, it would blow your mind. These are how broker-dealers make their money, and these are also how the advisors who sell these things. Now, that doesn't make them inherently evil or bad. Again, what I gripe about it is the lack of disclosure. Um, I have no problems with fees if there's value for the fees and if the fees are disclosed. Many times you can't justify the value of the fee and many times the fee is, isn't disclosed to the consumer. Again, if you had any idea how much these fees that you'd be paying in your actively managed portfolio, it would blow your mind. So again, many of these fees are based on tra transactional selling too, which is an issue. So the securities license advisor makes more money when they have a high turnover portfolio because every time they sell a stock, every time they sell a mutual fund, there's a fee they can make. And we'll talk about fee-only advisors that don't make commissions and why they're bad. Uh, but a lot of times you'll see, uh, I mean, we actually had a lawsuit when I practiced law full-time where, where a, 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 an advisor what we call churning, they churn the account. Wow, we looked at this account, we noticed that you made 750 trades this year. That seemed like an awful lot, and the advisor made a, a boatload of money, and by the way, you think with 750 trades, they were all, you know, half of them were at least good? Why does your portfolio go backwards? So be careful of the, the transactional uh, nature of your, of your account. If you're working with an advisor who makes money on transactions, that may be one of the reasons that they're doing it. All right, let me talk a little bit about local money managers. This always comes up. Because everybody, you know, everybody likes to think they have the best money manager. I got news for you. There aren't many good money managers out there. Uh, you know, there was one at Fidelity years ago. Uh, and if you've seen any of my other presentations, you'll know that 80% of the mutual funds don't beat the indexes themselves. But we have all of these people buying mutual funds because they think they're going to beat the indexes where 80% of the time they don't. These are people, look, 
people running mutual funds are pretty well schooled. They've got their MBA, they have their CFA, which is a designation uh, I think is a good one. And these people are running a billion dollar mutual fund. And they don't know what they're doing as compared to, at least, they're not doing as good as the indexes. And what's an index? You put your money in an index and it just grows with a whole group of stocks. Um, and now we're expected to think what? That my local money manager somehow has cornered the market on knowledge on money management? So you go down to the corner, you go down to your local AG Edwards person or whomever and say, well, you know, that person knows what they're doing. They've got a securities license. They have some designation after their name. This is the person you're going to give your money to. Do you actually think that they spend all of their time researching all the investments that they need to in order to give you the best advice? That's not the case. And depending on the broker dealer they work with, where are they getting their advice from? Well, they're getting it from the broker dealer. And each broker dealer has their specific niche whether it's LPL or Merrill Lynch or whomever it may be, that's who they're looking to to get their advice. And as somebody who knows many of them, you know what happens? During the week, during the month, during the year, the broker-dealer will tell, will come down from on high. These are what we'd like you to put your clients in. And you know what happens? That's what they put their clients in. So don't expect your local money manager to have an infinite amount of knowledge or even a lot of knowledge uh, on a personal level to be giving you specific spot, uh, stock and mutual fund advice. They're getting the information from somewhere else and that advice may be coming from a tainted source. Why? How do broker dealers make their money? Putting investments in certain places, right? Money management, fees, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really a terrible system we have set up in the money management world as a disincentive to provide low transactional uh, business or low transactional portfolios for our clients that really if you look at the statistics is really the way to go because buying high and selling low is what the American public does and it's a great way to uh, not grow your wealth uh, anywhere near what the indexes would do themselves if you just bought and hold. Alright so liability. One of the reasons I want to talk quickly about broker dealers is the liability issue. There are more lawsuits than you can shake a stick at as you can imagine right now in the securities field. When the stock market tanks 59% and we had a seven-year-old who had a stock jockey or money manager who in their infinite wisdom had a seven-year-old in stocks and mutual funds and they lost 59% of their money, you've got a lawsuit. Because should a seven-year-old who's got a finite amount of money be in stocks and mutual funds that can go backwards 59% and the answer is no. And so the lawsuits are running wild out there and broker-dealers are so scared of lawsuits that they put so many restrictions on their advisors. Again, it's not that I, I, I you know, it's restrictions themselves are inherently bad although they could be. Uh, what's bad about the restrictions is the lack of disclosure, the lack of disclosure to the client. So the guy, the guy or gal who's got their CFP or whatever they've got, they sit down with the client and say, I'm a money manager. I, I clear through Merrill Lynch or I work with A.G. Edwards. I've got all of these resources. I'm here to give you the best advice possible. And just like the insurance agent, the, what's the disclosure? I can't give you this. I can't talk about that. My broker dealer doesn't let me do this. My broker dealer doesn't let me do that. Is that the discussion that the securities license advisor is going to have with their client uh, to try to pick them up as a client, I should say, or the potential client? It's not what happens. And so it's a vicious industry that we're in. I mean, let me give you an example. And again, one of the main reasons I wrote this book, my, one of my favorite, I have two favorite products out there for certain clients to, to grow wealth in a, with a segment of their money. One is an annuity that guarantees a rate of return of between 7 and 8 percent with a guaranteed income you cannot live. It is a terrific product. We should all be so lucky to have grown our money at 7 and 8 percent coupled with a guaranteed income for life. That's one product. The other one is what's called Retirement Life. It's a life insurance product that you can uh, design where the, uh, the cash will grow, grow tax-free. It will come out tax-free, you have no downside risk, and when you table the numbers out, and I cover them in my book, Retire Without Risk, you can grow significantly more money in retirement life than you can with the brokerage account with using reasonable assumptions. Now, those sound, they should sound interesting to you. What you should know is that many broker-dealers forbid their advisors from selling the annuity that guarantees a rate of return of 7% coupled with a guaranteed income for life, and forbid their agents from selling what I call retirement life. They forbid it. Contractually, they can't sell it. Again, if you sat down with a financial planner and you were 60 years old and you had a hundred thousand or a million dollars in an IRA, wouldn't you want to know that there's a product out there that guarantees a 7% or an 8% rate of return coupled with a guaranteed income for life? Wouldn't you want to know that exists? Well, if you're sitting down with a bad advisor, a securities licensed advisor that works with a broker dealer who forbids it, you're not going to hear about it. That in and of itself makes the advisor a bad advisor. But again, what's worse? It's not disclosed to you. Again, if that advisor said, I want to tell you that there's this product out there that guarantees 8% for up to 20 years, coupled with a guaranteed income for life, it's out there. It's actually kind of neat. I can't sell it to you. What would you tell that advisor? Hopefully you would tell them to get up and leave. 
So there's a lot of problems with disclosure out there and BDs are driving a lot of it. So be careful with that. All right, let's move on to what a registered investment advisor is, and I'll use the term RIA. Now, a registered investment advisor cannot make money from commissions. That doesn't mean they can't make money. Believe me, they make money. They just can't make money from commissions, per se. Now, what about compliance? There's, there's, they, uh, or an RIA can sell you stocks, can sell you mutual funds, can sell you bonds, can sell you variable annuities, can sell you all of these things. They just can't make a commission with it, which means that they do not have to clear their business through a broker-dealer. Okay? They don't have to have oversight from a broker dealer. Now, they do have to worry about oversight. It's called the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. So it's not like they don't have oversight, but they don't have this broker dealing, dealer telling them what they can and can't do. And so, uh, oh, by the way, if you don't know, and I didn't, I didn't tell it yet in this, this presentation, broker dealers read all of the emails or have access to all of the emails the their agents sell. So every time a Merrill Lynch agent sends a, an email, Big Brother, the broker dealer, gets to read it. Every time a securities licensed advisor through a broker dealer sends a letter to a client, they're supposed to send it to compliance first. Every time they do an advertisement, it has to go to compliance. This is why I can't stand broker dealers. Because again, the compliance is more driven about what's best for the broker dealer, not what's best for the consumer. So just be careful of that as well. So our, I like RIAs. They can give you truly independent advice. They don't have broker dealers hounding them on what's right and what's wrong, what they can and can't do. Um, so what questions do you want to ask your securities licensed advisor, whether it be an RIA or non-RIA? You want to ask them what? Well, the first one is, are you an RIA? And if they say no, then you got to go further, right? If they say no, you say, well, okay, you're not an RIA. Who's your broker dealer? And whoever the broker dealer is will tell you a lot. Now, you may not know it, but hopefully you can contact some other locally trusted advisor, or you can even email me if you want. I know the broker dealers, and I know the ones that are contractually hindering their, their advisors from giving the best advice. So depending on who they say the broker dealer is, you may or may not have a problem. And again, will the broker dealer, uh, dealer allow you to sell guaranteed return products? Will they allow you to sell what I call retirement life? Are they tying your hands? And with these very simple questions, you can at least determine whether your advisor sitting in front of you has a good chance to be a good advisor or whether you can quickly categorize them as a bad advisor. Now let me quickly uh, talk about fee only. Again, I know I'm throwing out a lot of different terms, but it's, if you're watching this on DVD or if you're doing this on video, you can watch it again. Fee only advisors. Let me just read to you from the slides sitting in front of me what a fee only advisor is. I got this straight from the internet. Fee only advisors do not work from commissions, but rather earn a percentage of assets under management. They assure that the personal interests are served of their clients and that the advisors are not potentially swayed by any personal or corporate conflict. Hmm, that sounds really good. They don't make commissions, which means they're not transactional based, right? They don't have to sell you something to make money. I like that. And because they're not making commissions, they can always look out for your best interests, etc. Et I mean, it sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, heck, maybe I should go become a fee-only advisor. I don't think so. To put it bluntly, the above statement is patently false. There are more inherent biases with a fee-only advisor than there is an advisor who clears business through a broker-dealer who you know I already don't like. Now, what's the problem with a fee-only advisor? Or let me start with this. Why be a fee-only advisor? Now, I've talked to dozens of these people uh, a year. They always call me. They get my e-newsletters my e -newsletters I send out, and they call me. Hey, I like that product. It sounds really great. Can I learn more about it? Yeah. What kind of advisor are you? I'm a fee-only advisor. Oh. Then you're probably not going to like this product because it has a commission. Oh. It has a commission. I didn't know that. So why be a fee-only advisor? Most of the fee-only advisors I talk to say they became fee-only advisors because it's great marketing. That's wonderful. Why did you go into that industry? Uh, well, because I thought I could make more money because I could market myself better. Really? Is that really in the consumer's best interest? Great marketing. It sounds great when I sit down in front of a client, I say, who's your current money manager? Well, they work at Merrill Lynch. Well, they're commission-based. I'm fee only. I don't sell commission-based products. I'm independent. You should work with me and get rid of your other advisor. I mean, that's really the sales pitch. And it sounds very compelling. Independent advice, it sounds wonderful, right? Well, how do they make their money? They do make money. They make it on fees, not transactional commission fees, but on charging you a fee. Typically, they're, they're, they're going to charge you a fee, $2,500, whatever it is, for the privilege of having them look over your situation so they can tell you what to do and why you should become a client. I love that. But they're, they're going to make a fee on the assets under management. So you have a million dollars in a brokerage account that you used to have at Merrill Lynch. They'd like to take it over because they're independent. They're going to give you the best advice. They're only going to charge you a 1% fee to give you this independent advice. 
So they're getting paid and you're paying them, which is interesting, as opposed to having an insurance company pay a commission or a securities uh, structure paying a commission, you're going to pay them out of your pocket for this independent advice. Well, let's see how good or bad this advice really is. So let's think about it. If a fee-only advisor can't make money on a commission-based product, what are the chances they know anything about commission-based products? Where's their incentive to go learn them? There's this whole world of commission-based products. My favorite products are commission-based. It has nothing to do with me making money. They're just really good. Again, where else can you get a 7 8% rate of return coupled with a guaranteed income for life? It's a commission-based product. Now, if you go sit down with a fee-only advisor and you say, do you know anything about these annuities that guarantee 7 8% rate of return with a guaranteed income for life? Do you know anything about these products? You know what 99 out of 100 are going to tell you? Now, I, I don't know what that is, but it sounds, you know, it sounds like a commission-based product. And I don't sell commission-based products, therefore it can't be any good. What is the incentive for this advisor to learn commission-based products? It doesn't exist because they're never going to offer their client a commission-based product. What if they do offer a client a commission-based product? They, let's say that we found the one fee-only planner who actually does give independent advice. And they, said, and they actually know these products that I like that have commissions and do offer these unique benefits to clients. We found that one. You know what ends up happening? if that advisor is going to make any money. So let's say that million dollar example. I think you should take this million dollars because we could turn it into four, over four million dollars over the next 20 years with this guaranteed return product. With coupled with a guaranteed income for life. If they sell that, if they recommend to that client to, to buy that product, they can't make the commission. How do they make money? Well, I normally charge X amount for my advice. It was a million dollar portfolio. Um, as your money grows in the indexed annuity, as it grows in this uh, guaranteed return product, I'm, gonna I'm still going to charge my 1% management fee. This is what I do. I need to charge you this fee. It's how I make money. So if the client would have gone to a truly independent advisor, non-fee only advisor, and they'd have gotten the same advice, they would have been sold the same annuity, except for they wouldn't have had on top of that this fee only advisor fee of one point or half a point. You follow me? So. Again, a contradiction in terms, this fee-only advisor giving you the best advice. They don't know anything about commission-based products because they don't sell them. Now, what's the other problem? They will sell, they will sell what are called no-load insurance products because they can add on their money management fee on top of that, okay? So no-load insurance products. Now, if I was to come to you as a, a salesperson, I'd say, well, I've got these two products. One pays an insurance commission to an agent, and one doesn't. One's called a no-load product. Which one would you think you'd like better? Well, I would think that most, and I've had this conversation with many people, well, I, I like that no load thing because if there's no load, the insurance company has more money because they don't have to pay a commission, right? So it's got to be a better product. I got news for you. I've never met a good no load product in the industry. Why? Why would I say something so outlandish as I can't find a good no load product? Think about this. Insurance companies want to make money, right? How do they make money? By selling product. Do you know how many insurance agents there are in this world who make money from commissions? tens of thousands of them. And therefore, when an insurance company designs an insurance product, who do they design it for? They design it for their distribution network, which is what? Insurance-based commission agents, right? Agents who sell products and make commissions. So all of the research, all of the innovation go in product development goes into commission-based products. Then some companies, I mean most companies don't have no-load products. Some companies have these no-load products. They're sort of a throwaway. Well, we have these. There's some fee-based planners that use them. We don't put any time or energy into them, et cetera, et cetera. You follow me? There's a disincentive for the insurance company to spend a ton of money on no-load products. I mean, it makes some sense, theoretically, that a no-load product should be a better product. But I can tell you that, think of this. What if an insurance company that has a really good commission-based product put out an even better no-load product? They're setting their insurance agents up for lawsuits. Follow me? Because if the agent who should have sold the no-load product sells them the commission-based product and the other one was better, we've got a problem, don't we? As a former litigation attorney who used to sue people, I couldn't wait for that lawsuit. So the insurance companies are not going to compromise their entire distribution network by putting out a better no-load product than the commission-based product. I'm, I'm giving you a very practical insight into the industry that you're not going to get elsewhere. So my uh, position is on a fee-based planner, I, I, my recommendation is never use a fee-based planner. But here are questions to ask them. Uh, again, the securities licensed advisor. Are you a fee-only planner? Are you a fee-based planner? Do you know anything about fixed indexed annuities, which are that product that will guarantee you a 7-8% rate of return coupled with a guaranteed income for life? 
Do you know anything about equity index universal life? This is what I call retirement life. There's lots of different policies. Do you know anything about this? Are you able to sell them? Most of the advisors you talk to won't know anything about them. And if they're fee-based, I can guarantee you they won't know anything about them. And so, uh, have you ever recommended either of these to a client? And would you ever, uh, ever recommend these to a client? A fee-based planner is always going to give you the canned statement, which is, are they commission-based products? Well, if they are, then I don't deal with them. There's your tip-off that you're dealing with a, uh, uh, what I call a bad advisor. And so I know it's been a little bit of a long presentation, but let me go ahead and go through a summary. IMOs, what are they? They're a clearinghouse for insurance agents. Insurance agents use them to make more money, which isn't necessarily in and of itself inherently bad, but the problems with IMOs are they're going to give advice that's typically in their best interest to get them